Welcome everyone to another Vita Learning Webinar. Today we're going to have Mr. Peter Peasy discussing, uh, uh, well it should be layering is what we have. So I, now I understand Peter where, where there, it's flipped back and forth. So um, we have on the screen it says force and laminate veneers, but we have, uh, I think to, today's topic was supposed to be the uh, layering concept. So yeah. never Sorry, mind because uh, uh, Peter can uh, uh, certainly he's uh, a good enough technician, master technician that will easily uh, go into the understanding of ceramics, how it's going to uh, layer. And then uh, from your feedback, the audience, from your feedback, we'll find out if we need to do another one on, uh, on laminate veneers as well. Uh, so I apologize if there's a mix-up between the two uh, two titles and what we advertised online. So uh, let us uh, kind of get going. So just a couple things for the group. Um, your phone's on mute, so if you need to send in some questions to Peter, uh, go ahead and use that uh, question box to the right of uh, that panel. Just type in your question, send it, and then we will, at the end of the program, we're going to go ahead and answer your questions. And if you have questions about laminate veneers, we can we can uh, we can handle those as well. Uh, the workshop. I'm sorry, Peter. I actually put some some in there, so we're okay. I, I just in case. Just in case. You're always you're you're covering me. You're, you're, that's great. Okay. Uh, fantastic. You're you're making okay. us look good. <laughs> Uh, the workshop, this webinar, will be recorded, so you can go to our Vita North America YouTube channel, revisit it, uh, go back to listen to anything you want. Uh, there is no CE given out for those uh, videos uh, that are online. However, for this uh, webinar, by attending, we will use your registration information, and we will get you those CE uh, that's due to you. Uh, for an hour, hour and a half, but please visit us uh, on our Vita Learning website. We've got uh, all of Peter's uh, previous webinars uh, videotaped and on that as well, so you might find different areas in which you're uh, interested in, and please uh, send us comments on future topics, future uh, materials, and or activities that you think would be a good for, uh, for Peter to go over as well. Uh, so, Peter, how are you doing? I'm doing all right, actually. Nice to be back home after a long few days with you. It was good to see you face to face. Yeah, no, it was it was good. Uh, we attended a uh, area dental lab, which is a uh, United States Air Force uh, called they called area dental labs for everyone that they um, bring in all of the military personnel from the branches, from the Army, from uh, Navy, and of course the Air Force. Uh, Marines as well, and we go over uh, materials. Peter did an excellent job, like always, on uh, informing them, trying to train them on uh, the best practices for layering, micro layering, and so forth. Uh, so I want to thank you again, Peter, for, uh, for attending that and uh, providing such excellent uh, training, like you always do. Thank uh, you, sir. So Peter is a worldwide dental educator for technicians, dentists, and auxiliaries. Uh, owner and manager of PZ Dental Studio Incorporated, uh, located in Staten Island, New York. He has a personal appreciation and expertise on all phases of clinical, laboratory, traditional, digital techniques, color communication, digital photography. He He's an expert in all those areas, plus more. Uh, the amount of uh, knowledge that Peter has, it's, uh, you know, unable to put it on a piece of paper to uh, we'd be talking uh, the next hour just on what you do and what you're capable of doing, uh, Peter. You're, but Peter's an excellent uh, uh, technician, master technician, and, and an excellent instructor, trainer. Uh, he's a board member of the Association of Master Dental Technicians, teacher and educator in the Master Dental Technician Program at New York University. Um, he's a faculty uh, member at YN NYU uh, School of Dentistry. He's a member of the American Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry, uh, executive board member and fellow of the Northeastern Nephrological Society, editor-in-chief inside 
Dental Technology. That's a great magazine. It's got some good articles, good um, view on uh, business, how do you run your business, and other uh, important things that we need to understand and continue to grow in this field with. He's uh, ACP Technician of the Year two th uh, from 2018. So welcome, Peter. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Thank you for doing this again, and we will get you started, okay? Sounds so great. let me turn you into the uh, presenter. You are now the presenter. And I will yeah. bow out, but I'll be in the background. Sounds great. All right, thank you. And let me get this up and running here. Okay, you got me? And we should be good. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction. I think the first thing we have to start working on is skipping all reading through that whole biography thing because I sit here and just kind of feeling silly as you're reading through it each time. But thank you for all the nice words. Um, so as Jim said before, I was actually slightly confused because I got two different emails and I kind of combined them as far as advertising our program. So um, the way I broke it down is just I'm going to go through some porcelain understanding and layering. I think most of you um, know where I'm coming from at this point. I'm in my office here in New York in Staten Island. This is my office in the background and my little teaching center. And as Jim mentioned to you, I'm the editor-in-chief of Inside Dental Technology. Um, I don't know if you read um, the editorial. I think it was uh, maybe two months ago now. It was beginning of the year for changes in the new year. And in that editorial, one of my focuses of the ed editorial was something that hangs on the wall in my office, uh, which is this little sign you see right here. It says, the world is changed by your example and not by your opinion. Uh, it was kind of a personal editorial to me, and I wanted to kind of state that. Um, this editorial, in hindsight, has become more important to me than it was when I wrote it. Uh, and the reason for that is because we lost somebody very close to all, probably a lot of us, and I don't know how many of you are aware and aren't, but um, a good friend of mine and somebody that I think was a, a great leader in our profession passed away this weekend uh, on a tragic accident from what I understand. And the reason that I thought of Steve and mentioning him here is because he was one of the people who lived by this example. He was a, a person who lived by making changes and and putting his voice into important things and standing behind causes. So I'd like to dedicate this time together right now to Stephen, who is, a, I consider, a great friend and a, a very sad loss, not only for his family and his friends, but for us and our profession. He was a, a great leader who really led by example. So uh, hats off to Mr. Steve Killian. I hope we all keep him in our thoughts. Um, I think the focus today is really about ceramics. So I'm going to kind of break it down in the most simplest way that I can for everybody. Um, starting with understanding where it's the most challenging. And I've showed this case before, and I'm not going to go through all the details of it, but I think we understand that really what's the most challenging thing we do today is kind of trying to match one tooth or two teeth. And, and although that is one of the most challenges, it's not the only challenge that we have, right? Really, the challenge becomes more about managing this space. And to understand space, we really have to understand how to utilize this space with the materials that we have. And I think that's where the challenges really come in for us. So if we're working areas like you see all the way to the left of your screen where I have a, um, a micro layer tooth, like on this particular single central, it really becomes my job to start understanding what materials do I need to work through in that, within that space. And I think Jim probably got sick of me saying it the other day in our groups because I did the same lecture, I think, four or five times over the three days that we were together for different groups, obviously. And um, I kept repeating a lot of the same important things. And the important things were understanding how to work in the space that you're working in and not just take the standard of, well, the manufacturer said I use the A1 dentin and the ENL enamel and that makes everything work perfect for me because it doesn't. It doesn't work perfectly based on how much space you have or you don't have. And that's why it's really critical for us to understand those spaces that we work with and understand which powders work in the environment that we're working in, like in something like this, where a very challenging single central, where we were working in six, seven tenths of a millimeter in the cervical, maybe a millimeter towards the incisal, and then a little more floating space in the proximal. But it wasn't an ideal scenario and a very difficult to, to kind of work my way through and make aesthetically as pleasing as we'd like it to be across 
um, across the rest of the arch and all the teeth that we're working through. Also, I think most of you know that for me, the evaluation is always after, and that's after we try the crown in, which I did here in my office. I'm taking this polarized shot and evaluating what I did, which was correct and wasn't correct, and I could see the, the pros of it, and I could see the flaws of it. One of the things that I do, this is where we'll break down, is no matter how I'm working through my teeth, I always kind of look at nature as my example. And the example that nature sets for me is the cervical third of your tooth always has a little bit more chroma to it, a little bit more translucent to it than the rest of your tooth. The middle third area is the value area, and that's the area where you seem to see the brightest um, or the most uh, light reflective area where the tooth appears the brightest. And then the third area is that incisal edge. And unfortunately, the incisal edge is probably the hardest part of this. Why? Because we can control the chroma and the value in, in a lot of space or in a little space, but sometimes controlling the translucencies and the look of those incisal edges and making them proper for the patient, meaning not making a tooth too young looking on an older patient or too old looking on a younger patient is really critical. So I like to classify that incisal third as really just age and effect. What are we looking to achieve out of the look of that tooth? And this concept that I've been teaching for a lot of years, which I call the canvas concept, really comes from nature. It really comes from looking at a natural tooth, like you see on the left of your screen, where I'm looking at the chroma, I'm looking at the value, and I'm looking at the age and the effect of that incisal edge, and trying to figure out what I want to create for my teeth that I'm working on or my patient that I'm working through. So what's interesting about this concept, and as I've kind of taught it more and more over the years, it's kind of interesting how it's developed for me. And what I mean by that is if I look at nature, look at a natural tooth all the way to the left of your screen, and you should notice the shape and form of that tooth. And if I kind of break my zones down that I just talked about, right, where I have the chromosome in the center and the gingival, the value zone in the middle third, and then I have the incisal zone, which is more towards that effect or age, look how those, those zones kind of tie in with the angulations of the tooth and the form of that tooth. And I think that's almost coincidental. I didn't realize that as I was developing my, my canvas concept, but as I start to have taught it more and more over the years, it's kind of interesting to me how that's happened. And we get to really see that these zones are true zones, not only based on the value, the chroma, and the aesthetics of the translucency, but also on the angulations of the tooth that we're following. I think that's an important part for us to take into account as we work through the process. Also, I think you need to know as we break through ceramic materials that ceramic is designed from all the manufacturers, design them very much the same way, to work in 1.2 to 1.5 millimeters of space. That's what it's designed to do. And some of these areas are much more challenging to us, like the cervical third, or the incisal third based on either too little space in the cervical third or too much space in the incisal third sometimes where there is nothing after the prep ends. And I'm gonna show you some ways to manage that. I think I've discussed them a lot in previous lectures, but the bottom line is I need to manage those areas the most. And that's about my knowledge of the materials. And at the end, I need to finish my restoration with at least two tenths of a millimeter of enamel towards the cervical up to about five tenths of a millimeter of enamel towards the inside of the edge in order for my tooth to look natural and look real. And those are standards that I can't get away from. So what am I looking for as I'm working through this process? Well, I'm looking to manage the aesthetic appeal of the tooth or really the light dynamics. I wanna be able to control the light that goes into the incisal edge. And I'm gonna do that mostly through my translucent wall that I'm creating and then through mammal line materials and effect materials which I'll break down as we go through the, our, our time together today. I also want to deal with my cervical third, which is even more challenging because I have usually less space, sometimes one millimeter, eight tenths of a millimeter, and it's a much more challenging area to work through. Simplicity for me is usually about ceramic margin materials here or changing the effectiveness of the chroma that I use, meaning that if I'm working on an, one, an A1 tooth, I'm not going to use A1 in this very thin area. I might increase that to A2 or A3 to increase the chroma and increase the light absorbance down by the cervical. And then that middle third of the tooth where I get the most reflective area of the tooth, this is the area where I want the value to seem the brightest 
and I want the light to come in the tooth and kind of bounce back out of the tooth and have that more reflective area to make the value appear higher, especially in that middle third of the tooth. Now, for you to understand this, I think you have to have a good understanding of the opacity of the materials that we work through. Um, and without making this too much of a challenge online, I'm just going to kind of cut to the chase and say that most of the dentins and the enamels that we use are a lot more translucent than people are aware of. And the best example is the one all the way to the left of your screen. That is dentin at one millimeter thick. And I think if you look at that dentin, which by the way is about where you use your dentins most of the time, we tend to work between about six tenths to eight tenths of a millimeter with our dentin materials. And if you look at that dentin at one millimeter thick, you should notice that I'm seeing the white behind it or the blue behind it or the black behind it, which means what? It's fairly translucent. And I'm getting my, my value or chroma effect from what's behind it more than I'm getting it from the actual dentin. So because of that, I have to be more conscious of the dentins I choose to use, especially when I have minimally, minimal spaces to work in. The one you see in the middle of your screen is an opacious dentin material. And this is the one that kind of bothers me even more because the opacity of these materials are not more than usually a 40, 50%. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention the opacity on the, on the dentin. It's usually around 33%, sometimes 34 or five, depending on which ceramics you use. But from that point of concept, just think of that. If my dentin is 34% opacified, that means 66% of the light passes right through it. So that's the difference in managing that optical ability to reflect or absorb light. When I go to the more opacious materials, like in my VM9 kit where I'm using maybe a CP or an EC material, these are more opacified, but the flow with that is we don't use them as thick as we would use a normal dentin material. So yes, at 50, at one millimeter thick, opacious dentin or, or effect chroma or chroma plus might be about 50% opacified. Problem is you never use it at one millimeter in thickness. You tend to use it at two, maybe three tenths of a millimeter thickness. And what you get when you do that is exactly what you see here in the center of the screen. You get a lot of translucency and a lot of the color underneath coming right through. So you're not really utilizing that material as well as I'd like you to utilize it unless you change the concept of the material. And to do that, like you see all the way to the right of your screen, I'm doing that by either increasing the chroma of the material or increasing the fluorescence of the material to scatter light slightly differently. So I'm not using the material exactly the way I think we're taught to use it. Simplicity, if you ask me to make A1, A1 opacious dentin is not the material I would use at the cervical. I'd probably be in the A3 or A4 range for opacious dentin. Why? Because at that thickness, it's not truly that A3 or A4 anymore. So I'm switching the concept to make it work for what I need to manage that light intake of what's happening with my ceramic across the board. And that's standard for me. This becomes more challenging when we're working in space and we're working with our doctor's preparation. Because like I said, we don't always have that 1.5 to 1, 1.2 to 1.5. And especially if you look at a scenario like this, if the doctor is prepping these teeth minimally invasive, you know it's going to happen. We might have less space to deal with on the number nine than we do on the number eight. So that can't be. And part of our communication with our, with our clinical partners is to make them understand that for us to be able to work in space, we want to work in the most uniform space we can work in. So they're prepping these teeth, depending on which technique they're using to prep, or to manage the space, the right way to do that is to create an even canvas for us to work in, which means obviously you have to reduce a little bit more on the number nine, maybe a little bit uh, less on the number seven in order to make us have a, 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 um, a consistent amount of space to work our materials through and create the best form and shape that we can. Okay, so let's take a look at our patient as we go through the process here. And I think as we start to look at patients, it starts to kind of play into a better role for us. Um, this is actually a case I worked on a few years ago. And I think most of you know that as I work in my cases, I go through the face, the white and the pink, and we've kind of talked about that in many different lectures across, but I want to kind of dive into the materials. So the patient presented in this case to 
um, close their, their diastema to fix the coloration and give themselves a better shape and form of the tooth. We worked our way through that with a normal diagnostic wax up and a normal process that we normally would. And once we get the patient comfortable and where are they like, the next goal starts to be coming about what we're going to do for restorative. So I chose a veneer case to start with here because I, I was a little back and forth which, which, which case or material to go with based on the two different advertisements. I'll tell you that 90% of the time when I'm working with a reef, um, veneers, I'm using what we call an alveolar cast or a tissue cast. And the purpose of that cast has a lot of value for me. It really helps me to understand uh, where the tissue is and where I want to create my emergence and how much support. And I actually have a little video on the third case that I'll show you that kind of works through this a little bit more. But just like I'm doing with any other case, the goal here for me is to do exactly what I mentioned in my canvas, is to create chroma, to create value, and then decide what kind of an effect or age that I want. So the way I really define those things is the chroma on that cervical is the area where I'm gonna have the highest intensity of color, but because of that higher intensity of color, I'm gonna get the most light being absorbed into that cervical third of the material. Where in the middle third of the tooth, where you see the word value and you see that yellowy powder there, that's the area that I want to be brighter or higher in value. And in order to get that value, it's not just about using a whiter, brighter powder. Sometimes it's about using a powder that has more of a reflective index, a high opacified material, like an effect chroma or maybe a, a chroma plus or an opacious dentin material, something that is naturally more reflective, but obviously brighter. And then the third part of that is the age. And this is where I'm really looking for more translucency. Part of the challenge here isn't just about creating this window of translucency, but really about creating a contrast between where the chroma is, where the value is, <clears throat> and where the translucency is. Sometimes what really makes things stand out or pop more is really about contrast. Putting A4 next to B1 is a huge contrast. And that's kind of what makes you see the differentials and being aware of those contrasts are very critical for us. So as I work my way through the case, everything that I'm doing in my layering, and I'm not breaking down specific powders because I'm gonna say it doesn't really matter. The powders are based on chroma, value, and age and translucency. So really all I'm trying to do is make sure that in that cervical third, I'm using something with more chroma. In that middle third, I'm using something with more value. And then as I get to that incisal edge, I'm creating that canvas or so that wall of translucency that I'm going to use to hide by how I place my mammalon materials over that wall. And you can see that more to the right of the screen. So the left of the screen shows the canvas, chroma, value, translucency. The right of the screen shows the exact same thing, except the edited, the additive mammalon type materials or more opacified materials to help distract that light from going through all that translucency and control that the way I want to do it. So I'm just following suit across the board and how I do that build up every time. And that's why in that first diagram that I showed you, you notice that little red patch up by the right of your screen right now. Well, what is that? That is my mammal eye material. Those are my materials that are going to allow me to hide or help to transition from where I have that brighter, whiter dentin material and reflective material to where I have the most translucence. And that translucence is where either the tooth, the prep, or the substructure has ended. And now I have to make that trans trans transition gradually to make it work well. And by the way, I keep that concept in my brain the entire time. So even when I start going to my enamels and my translucencies, what am I gonna do to finalize that tooth after I built my canvas? I'm gonna use a translucent at the cervical that has more color or chroma to it. I'm gonna use a translucent that has a brighter or whiter effect to it in that middle third. And then towards the incisal edge, I might use two or three different effects. It could be an opal, it could be a standard enamel. It's really gonna depend on, depend on what I'm looking to do as far as what effect I'm looking to create in that incisal third of the tooth. So sometimes I might want to go to an effect pearl like an EP1 in the uh, in the VM9 kit, or it might be an opal, an EO1, something that's going to either allow me to see into the tooth more or allow me to mask or filter the tooth more. And the reason I say that it's mask or filter 
is because for me, the enamels are, aren't just enamels. I call them filters. That's what their real job is. By a filter, your enamel either filters the light and stops it from getting all the way into the tooth. That would be a whiter, brighter type of enamel. Or it's so translucent that it's not much of a filter at all. The translucency lowers the value and allows you to see more inside the tooth to some of the effects that are there. So I always try to think of my enamels more as filtration systems than just as enamels. I don't want to think of them that the manufacturer said to use ENL, that's what I'm going to use. No, I want to think of them as what is my goal? Do I want to filter the light? I want a whiter, brighter enamel? Or do I want to allow more light in the tooth and lower the value of the tooth? Or make it look like a younger tooth and use more translucency, but then I need to support the value inside with my dentins and opacious materials internally. So it's always kind of a thinking game more than just using what the manufacturer has told me to do. And I think that's kind of the goal for us learning is to really understand how to make it valuable for us of what to do differently than what is happening across the board. And by the way, I think part of the, the other challenge that I'll just throw out there as I, as I get to the final of this case, um, I wanted to harmonize well with that gingival tissue. Look what happens as Dr. Mike starts to slide that veneer onto the patient's tooth and look how nice it supports the pink. Part of that is because of the materials that I've used. Part of that is the prep design and the clinical management of the tissue around it. And that's a real important aspect to us when we're working through the process. So here is on insertion of, of the four veneers. You can see the papillas haven't filled in yet. The patient's actually still really numb. This is actually on insertion a few minutes after. Um, but you can see everything's going to come in nice. And I never got a final, final photo of her. She's still kind of numb and, uh, and a little, you know, not normal looking here, I guess, at this moment. But that'll start to work its way through. So that's in a simple kind of controlled case. Unfortunately for us, that's not the norm. The norm for us is much more of these, what I'm gonna call uncontrolled cases. And these are the kind of cases that we're doing more and more today where we have difficult spaces to work in. Um, we wanna be as minimally invasive as possible as we're working through the process. And we wanna save tooth structure, and I get that. Um, also, sometimes there are implants involved in these cases. This particular one doesn't have one. Actually, we couldn't place an implant in that number 10 or the 2-2 two, two position based on the, the thinness of the bone. Um, I guess we could have if the patient was willing to go through some bone augmentations and tissue grafting, um, but they weren't willing to do that. So we had to work in the environment that we're in. And these environments become really tough for us because our patient Alex here um, just wants a pretty smile. That's all he really cared about. He wanted his teeth to look a little nicer. So we're gonna do what we normally do we're going to evaluate the space. And this is actually a great case for an additive wax up. Uh, Jen did this wax up here in the office and you can notice that uh, the shapes are really nice and, and it's, it's all additive. So we're not really changing too much of what's already under the tooth. And these are actually nicer wax ups to be able to put in the place in the patient's mouth because since it's all additive, we can make ourselves a little tray. We can give that tray to the doctors and the doctors can use this clinically to place our wax up in the mouth. And this now becomes our aesthetic evaluation, what we like and what we don't like and where we want the teeth to be. And I think you see that the wax up transit really nicely based on the, the skill of not only Jen's wax up, but the, the tray and then the, the clinical skill of our partner doctor who's actually placing this very carefully. They don't just fill that tray with uh, Bisco and pop it in. It's kind of a technique that they work on by putting that tray in and out feeling the suction, feeling it hit the palate, and making sure they get a consistency to it so that when they do align it with either a bisacryl or a composite or whatever acrylic they're going to use, that they know they put the right amount in there and they have the right seat back on the tray. And that's a real important part of our communication process. Once that's done, what's kind of nice about that now is we can actually use an APT technique. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, with the APT technique, this is something that I think uh, Garib Garel kind of really instituted, or at least gets the credit for today, developing this process. Uh, and you can see here, this was actually Dr. Bernadette who was prepping through this case. Um, I think the beauty of this is having this APT technique allows us to be as minimally reductive as possible, right? So that means that we're actually prepping through the aesthetic evaluation. 
And you can see that she's using some depth cutters here, which is really important. She doesn't want to be overly reductive. We want to keep the help and the strength of the tooth as much as possible. And you can see then when we get across to the right side of the screen, that she reduced just the right amount and a consistent amount, meaning that the eight and nine are very similar. Obviously, the lateral is a little smaller and the cuspid a little bit more, but these are fairly minimally invasive teeth. And although you might say, well, they're not completely minimally invasive, they're almost full contour, they're not, they're veneers. But the reason they appear that way is because if I go back a few slides, you'll notice that he had edentulous areas and diastomas. So because of the diastomas and the edentulous area, that obviously means that they can't be just facial veneers or, or non-broken contact veneers. They now have to be that we wrap those into proximals back to the lingual so we can change the emergence profile. And by the way, if you look at that picture all the way to the, the right of your screen, you should notice that not only did Dr. Sauer prep those teeth back lingually ideally, but look at where the margin placement is interproximally, which is going to allow me to have the space to make that emergence profile so she's created the proper working canvas for me. Now it's my job to fill the canvas with the understanding of what materials I need and how I need to do that. I go back to my alveolar cast. But here's the challenge with this case. You're going to notice that, uh, especially on the right of your screen, there's going to be a two-unit bridge that we're going to place here. This is going to be a cantilever bridge off the cuspid. We did choose zirconia for this case. Um, it wouldn't be my first choice for some cases based on the connector size. Sometimes I think you're actually going old school better here with a, a metal ceramic because I can get a thinner connector. But in this particular case, we had enough length on the prep tube to create a, a good four millimeter strength um, zirconia connector. So I was okay going zirconia on this case. But the problem is the optics of what I have are different. I now have natural teeth, which are gonna be veneers. They have their own fluorescence to them. Um, they have a nice structure to them, and I want to make a minimally invasive layering on these to fit the minimally invasive prep. Problem is, I have a pontic area, and I have a full coverage prep on the, the, the 10 and 11, and that makes it much more challenging. So I can tell you that I've spent the first part of this buildup really trying to even my space, to even my playing spiel, and create a canvas that is very similar to what I want it to be. So as I'm working my canvas, that means I'm going to have to incorporate some fluorescent materials on that 10 and 11 because I, I don't have any fluorescence in zirconia. And I'm not going to use the exact same materials on the veneers because I have fluorescence in those teeth. So I'm going to have to mix those materials to create the canvas that I need to get these teeth to where I want them to be. And once I have a smooth commonality in my canvas, then it's easier just to go back to the canvas concept. Chroma in the cervical, value in the middle third, translucency on that inside the ledge. Same thing over and over again. I'm not changing the concept. Back to my mammal line materials. I'm gonna start filtering that just like I did before. Again, brighter materials in that middle third, warmer materials in that cervical area, and then my mammal line materials. Sorry about that phone. My mammal line materials. Um, towards the incisal edge. And like I said to you in the first case, I'm doing the exact same thing over and over again. When I go to my translucence or my filters, what am I doing? Chroma in the cervical, value in the middle third, translucency or not as much translucency in that incisal third, depending on the effect that I'm looking for. And then I have my nice final buildup where I filtered all my ceramic material with my, my filters or my enamels. And then at the end, I'll fire that. Now, remember, I have veneers on the six, seven, eight, and nine. And then I have full coverage or micro layered, I really should say, uh, numbers 10 and 11. So uh, the goal is to make them aesthetically look the same as best as physically possible. And I do that by, again, managing the materials to make them very similar to nature. So you see this from the lingual. Uh, I hope you noticed right away that obviously the veneers are, are fairly micro except for the wraparound. And then you see the full coverage there on that 10 and 11. And if you look at it from the lateral point of view, I hope the 7-8 relationship looks just the same as the 9-10 relationship. And that's really the goal. And obviously we don't know that until we go more in the intraoral environment. And here we are, I believe on insertion or maybe a few days after insertion. 
Uh, and you'll notice yeah. that we have a, a very similar value and the aesthetics yeah. are very similar across the board. The tissue is healing nicely, the pillars are filling in. Unfortunately, I had to do a little tiny bit of a ridge lap, which is not something I really ever want to do. But because of the higher smile, we wanted to try to keep that 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 uh, gingival position up a little bit higher on the patient. Um, but in general, had he not had such a clap of tissue, I would have rather created more of an ovate site there to make that a little bit better for us aesthetically. And there is a final anterior case. Um, I don't believe he's come back yet to work on the lower arch. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. But uh, we delivered what he really wanted was that aesthetic look and closing the spaces. And I always say, look at the eyes at the end, because the eyes are really what makes you feel comfortable that the patient uh, liked or didn't like what they had. Okay, so I'm going to jump back into minimally spaced veneers. Uh, and I think the challenge here is when we're working with the minimal space, it becomes more challenging for us to utilize the materials that we want. And again, making that APT technique to make sure that we prep the teeth in the right direction. This is really more critical in veneer world. Why? Because if the doctors or our clinical partners aren't prepping the teeth the right way, it makes it very difficult to make the spacing useful to us and get the light reflection from the inside. Remember I said to you that the uh, uh, dentins that we use and the enamels that we use are fairly translucent. So that means we're using a veneer, we're gonna get a lot of the color from the inside of the tooth. And if the tooth isn't prepared properly, meaning that it doesn't roll and follow the angulations of the tooth, or it has any sharp or, or kind of weird turns to it, it's going to be a challenge for us to get the optics of the tooth to look right after they're inserted. So I don't really want to see these sharp angles. I don't really like when doctors um, wrap over the lingual. And to be clear, there are times they have no choice, so I understand that. But in an ideal world, I'd really like to create that soft rounded edge around the incisal edge and just finish straight, up, straight off to a shoulder. That's where we'll get the best aesthetics and the best use of the materials that we work through. So I don't wanna to spend too much time walking through this case except to get into the, 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 the meat and potatoes of it. Um, I think you guys, some of you have probably seen this case before. It's a challenging case. The patient had some enamel issues that we had to deal with, but they weren't as bad as they looked. There were some ortho issues that we had to deal with and we had to move the tooth forward and we did that in a very aggressive ortho where we actually broke the bone to pull that tooth forward uh, a little quicker than we normally would. The reason I put this case in, even though I've showed it before, is because I wanted to say that part of our process is evolving. And I have to be honest, what I did on this case five years ago or four years ago, I would not do today. What I did on this case four years ago, and I did, I think it was four or five years ago, it was in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. What I did on this case was I actually used effect liners on my, um, right on the preparation itself. And the reason I did that was because I was trying to create some fluorescence on my veneers. Problem with that is I didn't need to create fluorescence on the veneers. Teeth have their own fluorescence, and I was wrong at what I was doing. So today, that's not an option for me. The only time I'm using my effect liners or margin materials is really gonna be on substructures like zirconias and lithium silicate. And part of that is studying and understanding. So if you look at this, these teeth as a natural example, obviously all the teeth are natural except for the number nine. And notice where the fluorescent is. Notice where the really most fluorescent part of that tooth is. It's more in that center third towards the cervical. You can kind of see it on the lower teeth. You can definitely see it on the central. And what you start to notice is that's where we really want our fluorescence to be. So when I'm using substructures like zirconias or lithium to silicate, I've altered how I build those over the last few years as, I, as I've learned more to understand the internal fluorescence. And this is actually a lecture that I've been working on now for a little while, or I'm going to show a lot more depth on this as we go on. Um, the restoration you see on the number nine, um, you see what happens under different types of lighting. So without fluorescent lights, it doesn't look as bad, but it also doesn't look exactly like, like nature. That's lithium to silicate, by the way. And this is kind of the, the, the negative nature of our lithium to silicate materials, is they tend to be very low in value and have this grayish hue to them. So just like every other material, it becomes our job to know which thing gets to choose, how to really push that value, and then how to create some fluorescence on that surface. 
So I've switched a lot of my fluorescent building on substructures, not on veneers, to more of this kind of a concept, where I'm getting a lot more of my fluorescence in that cervical, the mid third, and just bringing a little of that fluorescence up. And actually, this is probably about a year ago, I've changed even more since then. So you probably wouldn't see as many of those fingers coming up. I would just see more of that, we see more of that fluorescence up and down the line angles just to get a little bit more light reflection for me, okay? What's also interesting as I was going through this lecture that I'm building, um, I'm, I'm kind of looking at all different teeth and looking at nature, and I was kind of really blown away at some of the quality denture teeth that we used. Um, and this is actually denture teeth taken under the same fluorescent lines. And notice what they did in the denture teeth. They actually tried to recreate nature you'll notice the more fluorescent aspect of it is in that cervical middle third. And as they get past that, you lose some of the fluorescence. And I found that really interesting. And I think that's kind of a, a tip of the hat to some of the manufacturers out there with how they're really trying to create not only the materials for us to use, but also the materials we're using without the layer and without the forms, uh, without us, our, our interpretation, even those have some fluorescence to them. So, okay. Let me explain the tissue cast to you, and I'll do that by playing the video. Hopefully, the audio won't be too loud for you. And a little bit around my cervical. Now, the important part of the tissue cast, and I want to be really clear on that, is what the tissue class, class excuse me, what the tissue cast allows me to see is the emergence. Understand that the emergence is slightly not perfect because the doctor has packed cord. And this is why our understanding as technicians is critical here. Did the doctor pack one cord or two? And if so, how deep into the sulcus did they go? Because that's gonna make me think differently about what I see in the tissue. It can usually tell that by looking down after the model has been finished and I can see inside here. So this looks like a two pack tissue to me or two cord pack and that means that that tissue is going to come back so I don't want to build this out too far but I want the tissue to sit on my ceramic at the end and have a nice natural emergence at the same time I have to provide enough ceramic material to support the tissue otherwise what will happen down the road is the tissue will start to look weak but it won't be supported properly by the ceramic and we'll wind up having tissue that either looks irritated or not very healthy at the end. So that's a real important I think um, some of the doctors who are really aggressive with their cord pack think it's always better to get that tissue really far away and the impression looks amazing. And by the way, it does, and it's repeatable. The problem is sometimes when we've, we've manipulated the tissue too much and we have too much of a discrepancy to the tissue, will we get all that tissue back? Well, a lot of that depends obviously on the bone and the bony architecture, but it also now depends on us figuring out where the ceramic goes. So if that tissue is really displaced, as we build our ceramic, if we don't create the proper emergence, it's gonna be harder for that tissue to look natural. So dealing with the tissue is just as much a part of us managing the ceramic materials that we're using. The third part to this, or the last part I should say really, is going back to those mammalon materials. And I just wanted to give you kind of a little example of how I use them, so you can watch the build up here. All right, so I'll I've used my mammalon materials with a glazing medium. And I said I did that because I wanted to change the viscosity of the material. And the goal of that was really just to be able to control the material, being able to place it where I wanted to and create the effects that I wanted to. So I'm going to use a little bit of that glazing medium now. I'm just going to hydrate this incisal third of my two anterior teeth. The reason I'm doing this is what I'm trying to do is almost create a barrier 
between where I'm placing these and what's behind it. When you look at natural teeth, you'll see the metal I'm tend to float in space. So I want the same thing to happen here. So I'm going to take some of my metal on materials and start placing them in areas I would like to see them. So if I want a little bit of warmth, I'm going to give myself a little bit of warmth. Sometimes I might want the warmth way inside, but you don't even notice it that much. And I'll place a little bit there. I can come over that. If I wanted a pink or metal on material, I'd just lay right over it. Get something with a little different pinkish kind of effect. You can use more of an, a yellowish or an amberish kind of a color next to it. And that's the suit I would follow. And how many mammalon materials you use or when you use them is really about the effect that you're looking for. So in this particular case, I think I wound up using four or five different mammalon materials. What I always know, sometimes I need one, two, sometimes I need three, four or five. It really depends on the effect that I'm looking for. But that concept stays the same for me, no matter what is behind it, meaning that I'm always creating a canvas, whether it's on zirconia, metal ceramics, lithium to silicate, or veneer. I'm always trying to create that canvas and then figure out what I want to do on the canvas and how I want to filter through that canvas. Uh, so when I'm done with my, my main canvas and my mammalons, I go back to my enamels and that becomes my filtration system. Um, and I'll finish this, obviously, surface texture and topography, and, and that's all a critical part of it, but that's not really our focus for today. Uh, I'll finalize those veneers with a full mouth of veneers on one of our, our, our dentist fellows at NYU. Uh, and you can see, again, in the eyes that how much happier and more comfortable he feels. And he actually reached out to me um, a few months ago to say hello and wanted to come by the lab and say hello. So I hope he does make it here. Um, I'd love to photograph him again and see how everything looks uh, four years later now or five years later, which is so important. This is only a few weeks later on insertion. I think you can see all the little things that we talk about, especially if you look at the left of your screen, the chroma, the value, and the translucencies, and then obviously surface texture and embrasure spaces. Okay, so when we're dealing with space, I'm kind of being repetitive here, but I just want you guys to be aware of that the goal of this is to really think through the space over and over again, right? And make sure that uh, as we work our way through the space that we can manage the spaces properly. And to do that, you have different spaces to deal with. Like in a case like this, where the patient broke his teeth and have an accident, you know, a lot of us look at this and think that old school, we prep the tooth down and put a post and car in there. And I would say that's so antiquated that it's kind of silly. These kind of cases today, we can fix with restorative materials, whether they're with the silicates or straight um, feldspathic ceramics. Either one is fine, as long as you understand how to manage the space. So in this case, I'm going to use straight feldspathic ceramics. I know I don't have a lot of space to work in, so I had to trick the materials, meaning that I had to use a much more fluorescent material. All I did was incorporate some fluorescent stain into my opacious materials, and then I could fill that space and get the opacity and light reflection that I need in that three, four millimeter gap where I have no tooth structure. And that's what I would, way I would treat that. And once I've done that, then it becomes easy. It goes back to my enamel. I'm sorry, it goes back to my canvas that I'm going to create because I, I now have a working canvas or platform behind those teeth. And then again, mammalons, filtration, all the things that I would normally do. And look at the light reflection on those two teeth. You know one of them is cut in half and one of them is a little longer. But yet when you look at light from the lingual side, you can see it have a very similar aesthetic look to them. And that's really the goal when we're working through these cases is to manage through the process and manage our materials. And the last case or two I'll leave you with is metal ceramics. And the reason I put some metal ceramics in here, this kind of came up in the classes in Colorado is because um, like natural teeth, metal ceramics opaque systems have fluorescence in them. And because there's fluorescence in those teeth in, in the opaque, I don't really need to create much fluorescence inside the metal substructures that we use. I still use a good amount of metal. I still think it's a really good looking restoration, especially for the right case, um, especially for the right amount of spacing and if we're masking or not masking shades. And yes, whenever I do metal ceramics, 
very similar to my zirconia ceramics. I'm doing a lot of fluorescent margin materials around the cervical third. So I won't walk you through all the details. I'll just say when I'm following my metal ceramic cases, I'm not treating them any different. <clears throat> I'm working on my chroma, I'm working on my value, and I'm working on my incisal edge or, or age reflective for what that patient should be. I wouldn't want to put tons of translucencies and crazy mammal lines for this particular patient because it would look silly in that patient's face. So I want to make my teeth fit the face of the patient and have the right appeal for that patient to look proper in, in, in there before and after. And you can see that he has a, a masculine face and he doesn't really show a lot of upper teeth. So what I didn't want to do was put teeth in there that were too, too youthful for him. Or I, I always joke and say, maybe it's the denture we look that we didn't want. We didn't want to take denture teeth and just pop them in that face. We wanted to put the right teeth for the patient's age. And I think the metal ceramics are a real important part for us, especially as the implants come in. I still do a lot of my implant cases in metal ceramics. Doesn't mean I don't do them in zirconia, some I do. Um, but when I get into the more involved cases where we have a lot of implants placed and implants aren't always in the ideal position for us, it changes the concepts of what we can and can't do. And when we have these more difficult cases, I have to be honest with you and say, my brain goes right to metal ceramic, um, especially when I have implants that have different angles or, or larger edentulous spaces where I really need the support. I don't always want the, the brittle hardness of zirconia. And the other option here is especially when I want to treat the case slightly different, meaning that maybe I'm going to have to set screw because of some of the angles. So instead of being able to direct screw into an actual implant, sometimes I have to create an abutment and then angleize that, uh, create an angle on that abutment either through an angled channel or completely ignoring the angle of the implant and set screwing or secondary screwing into the actual abutment itself on a case like this. And by the way, I've gotten very old school on these. I just want to throw this out there that years ago, we used to use these metal bars across our metal frames. And we did that on purpose because of the flexual ability of the metal. And also as your ceramic compresses and fires, it tightens up the frame. And I have to be honest about uh, maybe about a year ago, I started going backwards and saying, you know what? From now on, anytime I cast a bigger frame that's more than six unit or starts to make the curve, I'm going to actually cast a bar on that frame. And the reason of casting that bar is really specifically so that as I fire that frame over and over and over again, I don't get any of that pulling or torquing of the metal. And as the ceramic is shrinking around it, I'm not going to get any uh, pulling of the frame to distract the internal fit of the implants. And I have to say that the last, I think, four or five cases I did this way were wow. <laughs> they literally dropped on the model every time out of the oven and dropped in the, the mouth uh, at the end. And obviously at the end, I cut the bar off, but I don't do that until the case is glazed and finalized. And even in the try in that bar is there. So it's a little uncomfortable for the patient, <clears throat> but I think it becomes really critical. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just like every other case that I showed you today, same thing's happening. Cervical chroma, middle third value, and incisal translucency. Just because it's metal ceramics, I didn't change the concept. I kept the concept the same. Finish up my case. Usually my pink ceramics I'm putting on towards the end of the case. I'll usually do that in my final glaze firing that I put my final pink on. And then we'll finalize our case. It's a white and pink implant case. The bar gets then cut off. And then you're going to see we have a, a tap screw or a set screw uh, on the internal aspects of, of this case. And here is the finalized case intraoral. Uh, and in the end, our patient was pretty happy. And I think this is kind of showing you that we're managing every material to fit the needs of the patient. And I'm choosing those materials based on what the patient needs. And then it becomes my job to fill that material the right way, whether it's zirconia, lithium silicate, veneer, or metal ceramics. So I think um, I'm just about on time here. Yeah, five two, so not bad. Our internet didn't cut out. That's pretty good. Although I did make a major coffee mess. I spilled coffee all over the place in the middle. <laughs> so I'll be cleaning that up for the next few minutes. Um, thank you guys for joining in. I'm blown away by the numbers I see here on. 
the people that keep tuning in every month and uh, I can't tell you how great it makes me feel. Like I said in the beginning, um, this webinar is dedicated to my friend Steve Killian. Uh, I'm actually altering my editorial for the magazine this month to talk a little about Steve and the important leaders in our profession. So uh, thank you guys for, for joining in. And Jim, as always, um, I'm here for a little while. So if we have some questions and comments or anybody wants to join in, please feel free. Now's your time. Thank you guys for joining in. Yeah, th thanks, Peter. And thank you very much for mentioning uh, the past, you know, Steve Killian. I have known him for years as well. And he's a very, very good uh, friend, very good uh, person. Um, just a, all around very him and his family and his kids and so forth. Uh, my wife even was a, a, a teacher at preschool for his kids at one time years ago. So, um, but yeah, it's it a sudden passing for sure. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, for talking about that, mentioning that. Uh, just a couple things let's, um, before we get to the questions, uh, let me bring up my PowerPoint here. All right, so uh, I kind of mentioned it earlier, those of you who are looking for CE, you'll get something through the emails uh, using the registration information that you provided us. The workshop has been recorded. That'll be uh, posted in a couple of days on our VITA Learning website, the VITA North America YouTube channel. Uh, so please visit us. We've got a ton of different um, webinars, videos uh, on how to use the product. Uh, Peter's done probably got, I don't know, I, uh, almost 100 probably now on that website. but. Um, uh, please visit us at that website. And then here, if you need to get all of your local rep, here's a, a list of the reps and the help desk. Uh, if you need some additional information, uh, Peter also provided you with um, his own uh, contact information. Uh, there's my colleague Paul, my information as well. And then we had uh, future programs with Peter and other uh, key opinion leaders uh, throughout the industry, whether dentists, whether dentures, uh, ceramics, and so forth. Please visit us uh, for another webinar in the future. Like to see you uh, come and visit. Uh, like Peter has mentioned, we actually have very good, even today, very good um, outcome with as far as uh, uh, attendees of these webinars. And and Peter does an exceptional job about breaking things down and actually training, which is really what we're looking for. I, I know, you know, we're Vita North America, but, um, you know, we like someone like Peter because Peter's more on the education side. You know, he's telling his story, not the Vita story. It, it's, it's, he just so happens to use uh, Vita materials along with other materials uh, as well, of course, but he uses it because it makes, uh, continues to make him uh, present well uh, for his clinical dentistry. So I appreciate you. Um, continuing to use some of the Vita products, uh, Peter. That's a thank you very much. Uh, as far as questions go, let's uh, let's get in it. Let me open up the question box here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, can't say enough uh, how important substrate value and translucency is for the final appearance. Uh, uh, that by Jay Braun. Um, and the question that kind of related to that is, um, I, I know there's no direct formula, but for a uh, any ceramist who's getting to know a particular product range, what do you suggest as far as how how does one determine uh, visually their and understand the um, translucency and opacity of each one of these materials? What what do you recommend, Peter? On yeah, that so they can that, look actually, at. Uh, yeah, that's actually a great question. I think, well, in fairness, uh, I, I think it was Jim who asked this question, Jim Braun, he said, in, in fairness, the manufacturers, and, I, and I've been to a lot of the ceramic factories throughout the world where I've helped develop and build some ceramics, and I can tell you they put a lot of time and effort into creating a ceramic material for you, 
that works in the space that you're trying to work in, which is 1.2 to 1.5. And that's really their goal, and that kind of matches a, a shade guide fairly well. The flaw with that concept is you don't, you, you hardly ever work in 1.2 to 1.5. Um, also, your firing parameters can be a little off. It makes the ceramic more translucent or more opaque. So really what I would, would argue is that the really best way for you to understand it is to learn to think, to learn to see the teeth that you're trying to build and what you're trying to emulate in that tooth. And, I, and I've tried to break that down um, with my, my canvas concept of understanding that I want more chroma in this area, more value in that area. And now the thinking part becomes, well, how do I get more chroma? Well, maybe the doctor said that it's supposed to be A1, but if I use A1 and I use it in a very small space, will it still be A1? The answer is no, I need to increase the chroma. And on the other side of the coin, um, yes, the doctor asked for A1, so that means the value is A1-ish. I know I only have a millimeter of space to work with and I need enamel. How can I still get that value up? And maybe A1 is the powder I need. Maybe it's a bleaching powder or an opacious powder or something that's more light reflective to raise the value. So it's kind of a thinking process. And I know that sounds like a whimsical quick answer, but it's not. Really the goal is for you to be able to think through the process. And I think Jim, you were with me for the last few days and it was, we had a nice time together too, but I think you, you probably saw the one core that I was stressing when I was doing the hands-on portions was that Putting the powders down and picking them up doesn't really take any more or less time. It's really the thinking process of why I'm picking that powder up and why am I placing that powder in that area that, that I think makes us valuable and valuable in our profession. And I would make the argument, and this goes off the subject a little bit, that um, I know everybody's talking monolithics and, and even when we were there, they were the, the, the Air Force and Army were saying, yeah, they want us to do more monolithic this and monolithic that. And I'm all a fan of them. We do tons of them here in my lab too. I would just make the argument that layering is still the thing that separates you and gives you the best aesthetic results you can get. And I think we have to really be more astute when it comes to understanding the importance of powders, whether it's micro foley or minimal layering that will separate us and keep us viable down the road. Sorry, long-winded answer, but important one. No, I, I think you're you're right. I, I agree with you. I mean, you know, it, the the main thing for any system is that you know you, you can go beyond the, the the shade tab, like you like you talked about. It is a a guide. It is a um, it, it's not an exact. It, it's just a basic guide, a target, and that by understanding your porcelain materials, whatever system you're using. If you understand them, then you can start using the materials in the right manner, the right layering technique like you, you've uh, gone over with, uh, and you can achieve some outstanding aesthetics uh, by micro layering, even for veneers, as you mentioned, right? Because you have very little room to, to work with, so you've got to understand those materials and how they, the opacity, translucency, and so forth. Uh, so I, I appreciate your, your, um, you know, your guidance on this for, for everyone um, in the, on the webinar, uh, Peter. Um, another question, uh, our friend Yuri is, uh, what is the material you use for the dyes, for the veneers and the full coverage crowns? Are the dyes placed in the oven and then porcelain on top of it? Yes, yeah, so that, that's a refractory dye system for the alveolar cast. For years, we used uh, the GC Orbit Vest. They discontinued it. And to be honest with you, now that I've started diving into a lot of other materials, I, I almost regret that I didn't dive into some of them more um, because some of the newer materials, the one I'm currently working with the most right now that I'm liking is a material called Shera. Um, it is available in the States. It was a little difficult to get. and I don't remember exactly where we're getting it from now, but if you email me, I'll send you the information on it. But it's basically a refractory material that I build my ceramic on, uh, and that goes in and out of the oven with the ceramic. And then when it's all done, I devest that that veneer. And if I have to add or change anything later on, then I do that with the lower fusing ceramic. And all right. you know, I'll answer that question, Jim, for Yuri. The only other thing that I've done recently that I didn't talk about is 
There are some cases, especially with micro layered veneers, where I'm not using the refractory dye at all, and I'm actually milling my feldspathic veneer. And I gotta be honest, that's kind of, actually, I think I'm milling a four unit case today, Jen's milling a four unit case today. Um, so we, we actually love the concept of milling some of these veneers in feldspathic, and I can still layer over them, which is, which is fabulous. Uh, and it does avoid the whole complexity of the alveolar model and the cast. And that's a real difficult kind of long cast to make. So um, will I make it for the right cases? Of course I will. And some of those cases, I would argue that the Mark II or the Felspathic milled veneers may not be the right material for. But there are also a lot of cases I'm finding it is the right material for. And that's where I'm going to mill those cases and avoid the whole refractory concept. Thanks for the tip on uh, Shearer. Uh, as many of us know, the um, the investments, the uh, refractory materials are really drying up and hard to get nowadays uh, that work correctly anymore. So uh, thanks for that, Peter. Um, the other question here, here is, what is your recommended location for transparency? Do you apply transparency uh, clear on top of, of the enamel effect and mammalons, or do you build it up underneath your mammalons and uh, enamel effects? So it would usually almost always be under. Um, I think one of the flaws of translucencies that I see a lot of technicians do is we tend to think translucency is this little bar across the incisal edge. And I would argue the translucency is, is the whole incisal third of the tooth, and even maybe halfway down to the midpoint of the interproximal areas. That's really where the translucency is. Um, after that, if I'm using transparent materials, maybe a clear, and on some cases I would, if I, if I, if I want to have a little bit more of a depth, or maybe I don't have the amount of space I need that I need to get a little bit more translucency out of it, a clear would work well. In general, that's going to be behind the mammalon materials, and that helps the mammalon materials to seem like they float a little bit more if they float over that transparent wall behind them. And then, uh, kind of uh, related as far as the age and physal age, um, is there a quick recipe whether you use uh, transparent or clear? for a younger patient and or a uh, modeled uh, like a neutral or uh, a mix of stuff or incisal for uh, older patients? Yeah, I think the answer is, and I have some pictures of this somewhere, but it would take me 10 minutes to find them. So uh, the simple answer is younger teeth tend to have more value to them. They are brighter. They tend to have more mammalons and they tend to have more translucency. So if you think of all three of those things in a younger tooth, what do I need? I need to raise the value from the inside, create my mammalons, and then finish with more translucent. That's kind of the, the younger tooth concept. Older teeth tend to have less enamel on the surface, but whatever enamel they have is usually very transparent because of demineralization and age. Secondary dentin usually forms inside the tooth. So those mammalons that were fingers at one point Kind of become one color or, or one look to them and i'm allowing that translucency to get more depth inside the tooth but now i have more opacity closer to the surface so let me repeat that younger teeth higher value more translucency more mammalon material older teeth more opacity inside less mammalon structures more translucency to the outside all right, yeah, on your uh, PFMs, on your metal ceramic material, do you, do you use uh, more opacious dentin or any other material that to cover or mask out your opaque um, headlight yeah, so, effect? Yeah, so 100%. I think one of the things you do to mask that headlight effect is how you manage the opaque system. Um, for us, we use probably four or five opaques when we opaque the crown. Uh, and some of those might be chromer opaque, some of those might be valuable opaques, and some of them might be violet materials, things that absorb light and shift the light dynamic. Um, but yes, in a standard metal ceramic crown, especially in the beater world, uh, I'm almost always using a chroma plus or an effect chroma. If I was in a different ceramic material, maybe I don't need it, right, depending on which ceramic you use. Why? Because some of them have more opacity in the dentins. So 
that's a good thing in some ways and a bad way thing in some ways. And it's kind of our job to know what to use and when to use them. Um, but standard for me uh, with VM13 is usually an opacious material, which is chroma plot, so or effect chroma for me. All right. Uh, another question by Danny. Um, any work uh, done on digital models? Yeah, so actually I think, uh, thank you, Danny. Is that Danny in Florida? I'm not sure, but maybe it is my friend Danny. Um, the, you notice that the wax up that was done in the case I showed on Alex, the six unit case with the two zirconia, that was pretty much all done on digital, at least the diagnostic portions. Um, when it comes to final aesthetic work, not the hugest digital fan yet of the models, meaning that um, good example, if I'm doing a single central on a digital cast, I got a problem. The problem is that the digital central does not have the surface topography and information that I need to match the adjacent to. So that's one area where I don't want a digital model is single centrals. When I'm doing a larger aesthetic case, four units or six units, uh, I'm kind of okay with it because I can obviously create the surface that I'm looking for if I'm matching other teeth. But also I find when you do combinations at this moment, and maybe other people are doing this better than me, um, but when I'm doing kind of combination units, implants, and veneers, I would much rather go to a, a manual cast at that point. Um, and also on some of the bigger cross arch implant cases, uh, I still prefer the, the manual cast. Although, Jen will tell you she's been upstairs all day printing digital models. So uh, we do lots of them. We're using them more and more. Um, I've done some veneers on digital models, not my favorite, but in the end, I think our world's pushing us there. And we have to start living up to the challenge of, of being able to work through the digital process. But like every process, it has pros and cons, and it's our job to kind of work through those. All right. Um, Sarah has a question. What what is the turnaround time for a case uh, with the layering techniques that you do? What's, uh, I know you probably get that a lot. How long is it taking you? <laughs> if you want me to bring Jen in here right now and ask, she's going to tell you we're probably six weeks away from the next case going out the door. Um, I think we ask our doctors for two to three weeks for smaller cases, single units and three unit bridges. Uh, and then when we're getting into larger cases, some of our doctors are pre-scheduling, but I gotta be honest, it doesn't always work out very well. Um, we're probably three to six weeks, depending on if it's implant involved or, or just veneers. For veneer cases, we try to stay in the two to three week range because it's much harder for the doctors to provisionalize the veneers. And we try to manage all of that in between all our friend doctors who are constantly rushing a case through and saying, can you get this one done for me right away and rush the wax up? And, you know, so I think a normal scenario for us is two to three weeks, but there are times where it's definitely more extreme. All right, thanks. Um, on, on veneers, um, so you got press, you can press veneers, you can mill veneers, or you can do feldspathic uh, build up veneers. Do you have a preference? Or which one's faster? Yeah, my, my, my choice number one and number two are both the same. It's feldspathic, 100% to me is the best looking veneer you can get. And by the way, I want to be really clear. It doesn't mean every case I've done feldspathic was perfect. It just means it is the most aesthetic one to work with. Um, I would also throw in there from a business point of view, out of the, I don't know, we get about two calls a week from, from doctors around the country. I'd say out of the, you know, 10 calls a month that we get for, for new clinicians who want to work with us, probably five or six of them say, I hear you do feldspathic veneers, we'd like to do those again. We don't like what we're seeing with the silicate wise. So it's a differential point. But to get back to your question is feldspathic is number one. How I do the feldspathic, either refractory or milled, I'm okay with almost either today, to be honest with you. I'm really, two years ago, if you would have asked me that question, was pure feldspathic. Um, layered today, uh, I'm starting to push more and more towards the milled feldspathic, and let me be clear about that. If I'm only working in three, four tenths of a millimeter, how many powders am I using anyway? I, I don't have that much space to use 30 powders, right? So I'm using two or three, so I can mill that feldspathically today, perfect. If I'm working in six, seven, eight tenths of a millimeter, all right, I'm using more powders, but I can now mill that core 
in two, three tenths of a millimeter and still micro layer all my powders on. So it's kind of the best of both worlds, the milling concept, but I'm definitely drifting more towards that, but it's still feldspathic. And by the way, just to be clear, the feldspathic material that I'm milling, uh, I thought it fired around 950 or higher, but Jim actually educated me the other day and told me that uh, it's basically a dentin that fires at like over a thousand degrees. So the beauty of that is I can actually take that milled veneer and layer it and fire it and layer it and fire it and layer it and fire it without worrying about distorting or changing as long as I follow the, the proportions of veneer to layered, I'm okay. All right, so uh, running out of time, so let's wrap it up with one last question. Because um, we get this question all the time, you probably get it all the time from your dentist. Uh, philosophy for breaking uh, contacts for veneers. So I love the concept of not breaking if you don't have to. By the way, um, when you're working in digital world, this becomes a bigger problem, right? Because capturing that non-broken contact is much more difficult to read that margin. If you're not breaking contact, I've shown before, you must be prepping what we call elbow preps. That means you're getting a much deeper angle inside the prep, right, up, right below the papilla and right before the contact actually emerges. Um, but there are a lot of cases where I say breaking contact is a must because if you're changing shape or tooth form or closing into proximal spaces, you have no choice. So I like to tell everybody that there shouldn't be one audible that you pull every time that, you know, this is the way we do it. Everyone is per case basis. You have to look at the case, you have to evaluate the position of the tooth, the final aesthetics, and that's where we really make our choice from. All right, well, thank you, Peter. Um, very great, you know, it's great information as always, very educational. Uh, you did an excellent job balancing the veneers versus the layering of ground. So thank you very much for, uh, uh, doing that for us. Uh, everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, any last words for, from you, Peter, or before we say goodbye? Well, just thank you to everybody for joining in. Uh, uh, hats off and, 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 and sympathies and, and, and regret for uh, the Killian family, a great family, his wife and his kids, and, and the brother who's also a technician. And uh, I can't say how devastated I was when I heard the news Sunday night. So it really it affected us a lot. I think um, you know we have a small, great community in our profession, and I know I have a lot of friends that, you know, some of them are popping in every time, and and boy, it's important that we we maintain those friendships, I guess, before it's too late. So, um, yeah. love for his family. All right. Well, well, thank you again, Peter, uh, taking the time out of your day to to help educate others. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, you have the information to get a hold of Peter on your screen. You can also visit uh, Vita North America YouTube channel to refresh yourself with everything that Peter has uh, gone over today. Uh, we will post uh, that information here in about a um, about two, three days or so. So I want to thank everyone for joining us. And appreciate all your all your questions, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again on the next uh, webinar. So everyone, take care, and this will now end today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.